of your transactions, then you got to understand the reason that accounting has become complicated is because our transactions have become complicated. Let, let me tell you, let me give you context to this. In the good old days, we take out a loan with the bank, normal, normal loan. Let's say it was a fixed rate of interest, 7, 8%, whatever the case may be, or it was a floating rate of interest. We were happy with that in the good old days. But what happens now? People want to manage that interest rate risk. They go over and above that loan. They take out an interest rate swap. Now, interest rate swap is a complex derivative instrument. You pay nothing for it. But what does it do? It creates volatility in your financial state. We have made our businesses, or we have made transactions complicated. For example, another example, I need to buy inventories from Germany. Items of inventory from Germany. I have to pay the supplier in euro. Good old days, simple transaction. Simple transaction, yes, I have foreign exchange risk. Now I decide to take out a forward exchange contract to manage that risk. What have I done? I've introduced into my business a derivative. So I may have had a simple manufacturing process but through my transactions, yes, I've created complexity. And what IFRS is trying to do is respond to that complexity. If you look at the various schemes of funding that we're seeing post-crisis, you'll realize how complicated these schemes are. And IFRS is trying to respond to those schemes. It's trying to help you decide whether these are debt or equity. And in that interpretation, perhaps people feel there's complexity. But the point I'm making here, yes, IFRS has become complicated, but mainly, mainly it has become complicated because transactions and business has become complicated. If business and transactions were simple, normal, easy, accounting would be easy. I mean, I recall when we were at university, IFRS was 300 pages long. Today, 1,800 and some odd pages. To make matters worse, I mean, every firm has their interpretation of IFRS, 2,000 pages. But I'm still glad it's not U.S. GAAP. <laughs> U.S. GAAP is 25,000 pages of codified standards. But what I'm trying to say is standards have become bigger. And you know what? I'm going to show you a few more slides. What's on the horizon? And you're going to realize that things are going to change even more. But why is it changing? Yes, there are factors driving that politics, U.S. GAAP convergence all those kind of things, but I think the bottom line is they're trying to capture the effects of transactions. That's what IFRS is trying to do, plain and simple, trying to keep score. All right, another complaint I get about IFRS, there's too much disclosure, too much. People always give you this example of HSBC's financial statements when IFRS 7 came about. What was it? 454 pages. They said, uh, you know, imagine a, a set of financial statements. Just step back and think about this. Financial statements, 454 pages. Balance sheet, one page. Cash flow, one page. Income statement, one page. Statement of changes in equity, one page. 454 pages. You know, at one of the New York um, analyst meetings, one of the people from HSBC made this comment. They said, look at these set of financial statements. They are so large, they are almost as large as the New York telephone directory. That was the point he made. But guess what? He said, who's going to read them? He asked that question. Somebody at the back of the room who was an analyst said, sir, I find the New York telephone directory very useful. The point he's making is that some people need that information. Now, I think we have information overload. There's far too much information. I mean, how do you decide what's relevant and irrelevant? Who is really going to be reading 454 pages? But the realities of IFRS are, are such that different people want more and more information. Regulators want more information. Tax authorities want more information. Analysts are demanding more and more information. I mean, look at IFRS 8, for example. It's a standard on segment reporting. 
It's asking you to lay bare your management accounts for everyone to see. And who asks for these things? Who needs these things? It's not management. Management can have access to whatever information they want. It's analysts. It's institutional investors that are driving this. So yes, what we have to do, unfortunately, we accept the requirements of disclosure that are there. But I think, what it, I mean, I think what's going to happen going forward is people are wary that there's far too much information. Let us just provide that information which is relevant. So that's increased disclosure. What else are we seeing? Increased use of fair values. Now this is controversial. Fair value is there. It exists. Your balance sheet currently has a mixture of items at cost and at fair value. Inventory at cost. Equity, most of it is remaining at cost. Financial instruments at fair value. Right? Now there's arguments for and against fair value. The argument for fair value, fair value is relevant. It's a good measure. If I bought an asset in 1970, I paid a very, very low amount for it, I would use the cost. But in 2011, is that cost relevant? Auditors like cost. <laughs> Easy to audit, isn't it? Yes, just take the cost, look at the documentation, great. We don't like fair value too much because it's subjective. But fair value, on the other hand, is very, very relevant information. It's actually keeping your score or measuring your temperature more accurately at a specific point in time. But there are problems with fair value. Let, and let me give you another little story to, sh to explain to you what, what these problems are. Working in Dubai, I realized how big this problem of fair value is. We had a client. The client was gifted land by the government. The client decided to treat this land as investment property because it met the definition of investment property. This was the only thing that existed in the company, this little investment property. They did some planning in the first year. They got opened up a bank account or two. At the end of the year, the fair value of that investment property went up. So I said, wait a minute, this is a simple, simple company. What's the problem here? And we were invited to the audit committee meeting to speak to the, to the audit committee. I'm saying, what do we have to speak about? This is a simple company. It just has investment property, got for zero consideration, or there was a token one dirham consideration. The fair value of this property went up. What do you do with fair value of investment property? Book it in the income statement. And that was what happened. Can't be too complicated. You know what was the reason we were called to the meeting? The shareholders wanted dividend. They saw profit in the bottom line and wanted dividend. And then I said, wait a minute, don't you realize, haven't you seen the cash flow statement? This is not realized. And we said, wait a minute, you are, Dubai doesn't have complicated dividend laws. If you have profit, you can declare dividend. How on earth are you going to declare dividend? Where are you going to source funding for the dividend? That's why now, in 2011, we're finding a lot of companies with negative equity. Because people don't understand fair value. Let me explain to you what fair value is. Fair value is keeping score of your company at a specific point in time, but some of the gains or losses are not realized. And that's what I've understood that, pe that people are not acknowledging, that this is an unrealized gain or unrealized loss. And that's why that's a problem. In fact, a lot of bonuses of people were based on bottom line. And when they're based on bottom line, if the profit is unrealized or if the fair value changes in subsequent periods, what happens? Things change. You don't know one's going to give you the bonus back, isn't it? That's the reality. All right, so what I'm realizing, fair value, good. It's good for its relevance. It is subjective. It may be difficult to determine in some markets, but it is still providing relevant information. It is better than cost. Cost is nice, it's comfortable, it's a comfort zone. IFRS is going more and more towards fair value. Another thing, that, another trend we're seeing in IFRS, limited number of choices. IFRS is tending to take choices away. I mean, before you had a choice to either capitalize or expense borrowing costs. That choice is going away. IFRS 11 
is going to take away a choice we had in IFRS for joint ventures. It's going to say joint ventures, if you have a joint venture, you are 